Hi there, I'm Tom Spencer. This week on Central Texas Gardener, Michael Shoup from the Antique Rose Emporium selects hardy roses to match your mood from romantic to vivacious. On tour, see how a hospital's tranquility garden assists the healing process. Daphne explains when to prune roses and makes her pick of the week. And Meredith Giles shows how to improve drainage in heavy soils. So let's get growing right here, right now. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net. We all seek tranquility in our gardens, but did you know that views to nature can improve the process of healing? See how the Tranquility Garden at University Medical Center Brackenridge assists their mission for patients, caregivers, and families. University Medical Center Brackenridge provides broad range care for the most complex medical cases and is the only level one trauma center in Central Texas, also works with families in extreme situations. To assist their healing mission, in 2012, they dedicated their Tranquility Garden, an 8,400 square foot oasis between the hospital and a state-of-the-art clinical education center. The Tranquility Garden is part of providing a healing environment to everyone we serve. In addition to patients enjoying this space, it's also a place that our associates in the middle of a busy, hectic work day can step outside, breathe fresh air, connect with Mother Nature, even for one or two minutes, and then return to the hospital environment and continue on with their work in a more focused, relaxed, tranquil way. There's a wonderful bit of research done on what's called attention restoration therapy. And it basically says that uh, views to nature really help kind of restore our ability to concentrate and to think. I've seen a brain surgeon sitting out here having his lunch and I've seen a two-year-old child running around here just delighting and, and being out in the open spaces and I've seen our nurses out here having a quiet time so it's really being used by everyone and it's very quickly become a vital part of this institution. The power of gardens to lower stress levels has changed hospital design. We know in healthcare today that in addition to the medicines and treatments that we can deliver, your environment is very important and how your environment makes you feel. How, whether it's noisy versus quiet, whether it smells pleasant versus foreign, um, whether or not it signals life like a garden versus a sterile environment. And so this is a perfect fit for the continuation of a, of a healing environment. A lot of research has been done through the years to show that when people have uh, visual access to nature that you know stress level comes down. For a worried caregiver, family member, or loved one, um, this space really allows them to step out of what feels like the rhythm of the trauma center and to come to the garden. People heal faster, they need less pain medication if they even have views of nature. So we wanted very much to create a place where people could do that. This used to be a terrible old awful gravel lot. The Tranquility Garden began when Representative Edmund Kempel from Seguin and wife Roberta spearheaded fundraising after Brackenridge saved his life. Dad had a, a, a cardiac arrest during the session, during the, the uh, 81st legislative session. So that would have been May of 2009. He actually, actually uh, died in an elevator in the Capitol and was resuscitated after eight minutes. So the first time that we came to know as a family, Brackenridge, was when Dad was here for a couple weeks. The walls get start to shrink when you're in the hospital that much, and just being able to come out here and, and look at the sky, but it was a parking lot. But was so, so great to us and so supportive of us as a family, you know, always here, you know, knowing that Edmund was in the best possible care that he, he, he could have been in, but taking care of us at the same time. So he really set out to do, to give something back to Brackenridge and started a fundraising campaign that would create this garden and thanks for what he, Brackenridge did for our family to be able to, to pass that along to, to others that will have loved ones here 
they'll have a place to come up here and reflect and, and pray. When a second cardiac arrest in 2010 entered his big heart after 30 years of service, his fellow legislators honored him with personal contributions to establish a plaza at the Tranquility Garden. Community leaders and donors united to fulfill the mission, joined by volunteers and Seton Healthcare Associates themselves. Everybody feels ownership of it. TBG Landscape Architects transformed the negative space between the buildings into a positive one. As landscape architects, we can provide spaces where people uh, go to feel better and can actually improve health conditions and whether it's you know physical or psychological well-being. Uh, gardens and plants and, and outdoors really provide that. I think the biggest thing that we thought is what, what's a comforting space and what's going to soften it and make you feel like you're enveloped and, and you're comfortable. So we thought about texture and color and kind of those plants that you think about when you were in your grandmother's backyard and those things that just kind of gave you that sense of home, that sense of comfort. So things that had blooming, you know, the, the roses, the hibiscus, things like that, that we kind of balanced again with some of the low water use Austin plants. Their design includes wide open spaces for meandering, children's frolics, and events. The Broadview Garden ambles into tucked in spots of harbor. People like to feel a bit, a, a bit of, of security, but they also like to see what's going on. So we did look at, with the access points to the garden, areas where you could sit back and have that space around you, but yet I can see what's going on inside of there. I can see through the garden over there. A cove provides a more intimate spot for families to gather. This place offers them an opportunity to get away from those stressors and to either meditate or reflect um, in silence uh, by themselves or with other members of their family in a calm environment. Fountains of water soothe patients, families and staff with visual rhythm and sound. The caregivers need to be able to have a place where they can become tranquil and mindful um, and to listen to the sound of the water, to have the plants around them so that they can regain perspective on themselves. So it's very important inside of you know healing environments that we think about how do we touch those senses, sight and smell and the sounds that we hear. Those are all very important to our kind of sense of well-being. We know that the noise the bright light, the fluorescent lights, all of those kind of things can impact patients' physiological state or individuals' physiological state. What this does is surround them with um, nature and different noises and the lack of technology, which is really important, I think, to uh, changing your physical responses. And it gives you a sense of peace. An outdoor space um, is one that really has no tradition, no one way of understanding God connected to it. Um, that all of us, no matter what our understanding of the divine, can come to nature, can come to a garden, and feel connected to creation. Its value to patients was evident in its first 48 hours when Kate Henderson offered assistance to a patient in a wheelchair. He declined and told her the story of empowerment. I was able to get myself all the way to your new Tranquility Garden and I want to say thank you for it because I've been in this hospital for almost four weeks feeling really um, immobile and um, dependent on others and tonight I got myself down to the Tranquility Garden and I was able to, I hope you don't mind ma'am, but I pulled a few weeds because it's such a beautiful space I wanted to keep it looking nice. And who would have known that the maintenance of the garden would translate to the patients? and that, that, that instilled him a, something to get out of bed, that I'm gonna heal, but doing that, he's also healing as well. That's phenomenal, it's just touched my heart. Well, gardens can truly be beautiful healing places, and it's great to see them used in that particular way. Thanks for opening the gates for us 
at that beautiful space. Now we're going to be talking about the Empresses of the Garden, and we are joined by none other than Michael Shoup from the Antique Rose Emporium. Michael, always great to see you. Tom, great to be here. Congratulations on yet another success in your wonderful career. Uh, Empresses of the Garden, a beautiful new garden book. Well, thank you. I've enjoyed I've enjoyed putting it together. It's, it's been fabulous. We were just joking a little while ago, and I said, this is a book about relationships. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have you kind of broken out the personalities of all these different roses, and we're going to be w walking through some of these different personality types. But it seems to me that uh, you don't know a personality unless you've done a little flirtation and courtship. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. It's a, It's like a It's a 30-year love affair with these roses. And, right. And there's been little epiphanies along the way, little mm -hmm. changes that kind of say, hey, look at look at me this way, or it, it changes the way you look at these roses. And, you know, at first I was all about how wonderful these roses are in the in the garden mm -hmm. as landscape plants. Sure. Their toughness, their durability, how they differ from modern roses, right. and the fact that modern roses were, were bred for their perfect show qualities, mm -hmm. but not for the garden. The old ro roses were, were champions there. Then as I started looking at these old roses and growing them year after year after year, I realized that they were actually even, you know, wanting to uh, show you that they belong in certain aspects or certain places in the garden, that they, that, that when they are in a garden, that they rule the court, so mm -hmm. to speak, that all the other plants kind of bow down to their, their power. <laughs> So and that's where I came up. in other words. Well, <laughs> prima donnas, but also, not only that, but they also control the strength of the garden, the feel of the garden, yeah. the persona of the garden. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's where I came up with the idea that, you know, that a lot of them fit into certain categories. Yeah. Some of them are, are truly romantic, you right. know? Well, and I want to go, I'm going to just list a few of the, of the categories that we can go in and describe yeah. what some of these different, but they're the reliable show girls. Tenacious tomboys, <laughs> big-hearted homebodies. These all sound like very definite people well, uh, or personalities. And, uh, and I, I think that these, these particular groups of roses fit that personality very well. Mm. Just take, for example, the tenacious tomboys. Okay, let's start there. That's, okay. a, that's a good one to start with. It's, and you imagine a very tough, you know, strong-willed mm -hmm. individual. Maybe prickly. Well, that's the way this, this, this particular empress the, these mm -hmm. empresses in that category mm -hmm. are. They're the kind that grab men off their lawnmowers <laughs> when they're mowing the lawn. <laughs> they're like uh, Mermaid and Cherokee mm -hmm. that are, are so big and get so out of bounds that they're always challenging mm -hmm. their space. Well, empresses must conquer, right? <laughs> That's it. That's it. But um, so, you know, that kind of encapsulates them. They're, mm -hmm. they're, they're tenacious mm -hmm. and they're uh, you know, mean, sometimes mean-spirited. Well, again, that prickly <laughs> part comes in true for, uh, I'm thinking about mermaid, for example, which is a glorious plant, yeah. but you better know what you're how dealing use, with. How to use it. We exactly. get more complaints from it than anything because people don't use it in the right place. Right. In the right place, it, it's, it's perfect right. because it will be a barrier. It will be a natural habitat for birds, but it will grow beyond your means, and it when it and when you try to tame it, it fights back. <laughs> so that's the tenacious tomboys. The generous homebodies mm -hmm. are a whole other group of roses that people are probably familiar with, and they include the ones that really anchor the garden. Old Blush, Mutabilis, yeah. mm -hmm. Duché, mm -hmm. Cremoisia Superior. You put them around the foundation of your house or your home along a fence line. They grow there with, with steady abandonment, always mm -hmm. there, always on the show. Uh, you can rely on them. Mm -hmm. They're generous. And they're reliable, so the, and they're kind of like stay-at-home moms. Okay. They're always there doing the hard work. I love that. And yeah. and, 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 and what you know, we, we, and we'll continue our tour of the different personality <laughs> types in a sec. But what I really love about this is that so many people out there do develop a personal relationship with their gardens in a way. And um, I th this, and I think you open your their eyes by labeling things in this particular way. <laughs> to probably something they may have been doing already but weren't even aware of. I haven't seen any other books really delve in, especially Rose books. They're typical dictionaries that are passed right. on that delve into this aspect. And yet it's the most important aspect of gardening, the emotional part of gardening. And, mm -hmm. You know, it's your relationship with the plants that make them have their value. Yeah. You know, right. it's it's in and that that's why it's hard to pick the best rose. It's the rose that you happen to be 
you know, that you've had a relationship over the years mm -hmm. that is the best rose. So yeah. I agree with that. And yeah, that's, the that's gardens why are the meeting place of man and nature. They're not either or. That's right. Yeah, that's right. and it takes that meaning. It takes that relationship. I think it's so important, and it's not. It's not. Um, it's not embraced as much yeah, as it should be. Right. Well, I want to get back to some of the personalities because some this is so much fun, frankly. <laughs> and, I, and I'm, I'm trying to think. You know, we talked about uh, different ones, but uh, genius-inspired trendsetters. Well, <laughs> I love you know, that as a category, and it, and it indicates what's going on in the rose world. Mm -hmm. And I tried to embrace newer varieties. Yeah. We've got the knockouts. The knockouts mm -hmm. have been a wonderful addition to our rose world. They mm -hmm. have completely, in many cases, usurped a lot of the modern roses. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want them to take over everything because right. it's one dimensional and boring. Yeah, if you exactly. Do that. It's like, but we have right. breeders that are now breeding roses that have these wonderful qualities. And we're going to start seeing fragrance again. Mm -hmm. We're going to start seeing, you know, beautiful flowers and easy care roses like we see with knockout with other types of flowers and other diverse forms. So it's going to be a whole lot more interesting than it has been with just the hybrid teas as it, as, as it was. So those yeah. are the genius-inspired trendsetters. Yeah. We're going to be you know, changing the world as we go forward. With I'm noticing of the roses. you include at least one of the English roses in that genius-inspired trendsetters, yeah. Graham Thomas, yeah. which oh, I think just, is a superb rose. It's just a beautiful rose and, and, and well-deserving. You've got the William Cords and you've got uh, Maitland, all those uh, mm -hmm. individuals are producing these roses now, but David Austin has done amazing jobs with his yeah. English roses, and that's one of our best. Yeah. Bright yellow, blooms, you know, just beautiful flowers, very, un almost un un on thornless stems, not very yeah. thorny, so they're wonderful to cut as well. Mm -hmm. Just a great rose. Okay, so uh, dreamy romantics. Everybody in, <laughs> who wants gardens with roses, I would think, they're will probably want dreamy. my favorite group, okay. and, and they include the noisettes. And, mm -hmm. And in that group are, are roses that typically climb. They have clusters of flowers. The flowers are held on weak stems, unlike modern roses, which have these strong stems yeah, stalks. that, that yeah. face the sky. These actually hang down. So when you get them on structures, they literally drip from mm -hmm. their arbors. So talk about a romantic setting. It, mm -hmm. That's what they create. And the fragrance is outstanding. This is where you want to have your morning coffee is underneath them, right. or even better, your wine at night. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, everybody does, when again, when they associate roses with romance and uh, having these cascading flowers, again, just adds to the atmosphere. There's something about that group of roses that is is so unique. They're all climbers, and so they're all going to be up above your head. Mm -hmm. And when you get that quality where roses are up above your head and they're drooping down it, it does it adds a ooh and ah right. nature you know uh, statement to the to the garden well let's talk about at least one more personality <laughs> type mysterious ladies well that goes back to our really our uh, you know when we, we started the nursery and that was we found roses growing out in abandoned home sites mm -hmm. and cemeteries and places like that and we had no idea what they were they were mysterious. They mm -hmm. were foundlings, and uh, and really that started us on the uh, you know the the trail of of discovery with a lot of these old roses. How tough they are, how time tested, how how durable. Mm -hmm. And so these are the individuals that we don't know what the names are. They have been given names. Rose, right. Roses like Highway 290 Pink Buttons because we <laughs> found it off of Highway sure. 290, or. Um, Mary Minor, which turned out to be the wonderful souvenir del Malmason rose. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. These are roses that we didn't know what they were. In many cases, we still don't today, mm -hmm. but they are still worth their weight in gold in terms for the gardener because they're so charming and beautiful. And real briefly, I know that in recent years that you've turned to really almost a complete organic regimen with these antique roses, and it's working beautifully for you. Oh, it is, and it just it's, it's common sense to me. Um, <clears throat> The synthetic fertilizers typically, you know, we're, I think we're arrogant to assume that we can produce them at, in the ratios that plants are going to utilize, and there's always excesses or not enough or right. imbalances, mm -hmm. which creates problems. Yeah. And so Mother Nature has been doing it for years with just her leaf litter and her, and her, and her mulches. It's food for the microbes. The microbes are good guys. They live in the soil. They've had relationships for plants for years, 
And so that breakdown of those mulches create the fertilizers that are wood. That's what we've embraced. All right. Well, Michael Shoup, again, from the Antique Rose Emporium. It's always a great pleasure to have you come by Central Texas Gardener and share your wit and wisdom with us. Now you're now your harem. I <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so we really appreciate right. you being here, Mike. All right. Okay, Thanks, take Tom. care. And coming up next is our friend Daphne. Hi, I'm Daphne Richards. Our question this week is, why is it recommended in Central Texas to prune roses in February? Well, we must have recently had an influx of new gardeners from more northern climes since I've been getting this question a lot lately. As you'll soon find out, if you don't know already, Central Texas has two seasons, summer and not summer. Spring, which most people associate with gardening, is virtually non-existent for us. So plants go from dormant to wide awake in what seems like a matter of minutes. That is, if plants even go fully dormant at all. Many roses, especially if planted in a warm, protected spot, may not even drop all of their leaves in winter. So how do we decide when to prune? Well, we have to be familiar with our general weather patterns and shoot for the tiny window between non-growth and growth. With most roses, this isn't too difficult since you can almost watch the bud swelling just beneath the surface of the stems. Most years, it's a pretty safe bet that bud swelling is going to happen sometime before the end of February, so that's why we prune this month. With roses, it's very important to choose buds that will grow outward before you prune, rather than toward the interior of the plant, in order to improve circulation in the center. This helps to keep these often disease-prone shrubs from getting black spot and other fungal and bacterial problems, so it keeps you from having to spray them. As you've noticed, rose leaves usually have a lot of red in them, so frost and wind damage, which exposes the red pigments, and even just normal leaf drop in the winter, are often confused as disease issues. Normal color patterns in leaves will be very symmetrical and usually first appear as a red modeling near the margins. Diseased leaves will appear splotchy and the pattern will normally not be symmetrical. And one more note on pruning. There are a couple of exceptions to our February pruning advice. Vining roses should not be pruned until after they've flowered and shrub roses such as knockout may be pruned virtually any time to keep them in shape. Our plant this week is Grandma's Yellow Rose, Rosa Nacogdoches a Texas superstar plant. This very vigorous shrub has vibrant yellow, almost tulip-shaped floribunda type blooms and very deep green foliage. It's also very thorny, so be careful not to place it too close to paths or doorways. It has a very upright and bushy habit, getting up to five feet tall and over three feet wide. Grandma's yellow begins blooming in early spring and will be covered in flowers all summer long. As all Texas superstars are, it's disease tolerant and insect resistant a very important quality for a rose. And another important quality for many people who enjoy roses, the flowers are fragrant with a light spicy note. They also do very well as cut flowers, remaining beautiful in a vase for many days. In order to perform well in the landscape, Grandma's Yellow needs at least six hours of full sun, bright a day. And it refer prefers well-drained soil with a little organic matter. But it'll also tolerate clay soils as long as it's not overwatered and has good drainage. It does lean a little more water than our xeric recommendations, and although it doesn't require it, Grandma's Yellow will be more vigorous and have more flowers if it's fertilized in the spring and a few times during the growing season. Grandma's Yellow looks great planted as hedges, so try it instead of red tip Photinias, Iliagnus, and Ligustrum. To do in the garden this week, it's not only time to prune your roses, it's also time to plant them. We'd love to hear from you, so please visit klru.org ctg to send us your questions or plants of the week from your garden. Thanks, Daphne. Now let's check in with Meredith Giles for Backyard Basics. Hi, I'm Meredith Giles here with Backyard Basics. And today we're gonna to talk about materials that are used to improve drainage in soil. Now there are several different types of soil here in Central Texas. And most of them have one thing in common, they're not very good. While some of them do drain well, most don't. Now adding drainage to soil isn't easy work, but it definitely pays off in the long run. For most of these materials, what we want to do is spread about a one to three inch layer on top of the soil and then turn or till this in a minimum of six to eight inches. So let's take a look at some of the materials that can be used to improve soil drainage. My personal favorite is expanded shale. Expanded shale is made by taking small shale particles and heating them to about 2,000 degrees. When they do this, it literally pops like popcorn. When that happens, the little shale pieces are filled with lots of air spaces. 
This allows the shale to both loosen the soil and help regulate drainage. It's a very stable material and will not break down in soil, lasts for a long time. Another thing we see used quite often is decomposed granite or granite sand. It's a much cheaper alternative, but it does have a lot more fine material in it, which can be an issue. Also, it doesn't have the water storage capabilities of shale. There are some other sands you might see out there also. There's things like coarse sand or river sand. There's also lava sand. Now, lava sand really isn't great for improving drainage, but it does have what are called paramagnetic properties that actually help stimulate root growth. Something like this would be used on a much smaller scale, maybe a half an inch to a quarter of an inch in an area. Similarly, there's green sand. Green sand actually is full of lots of minerals and micronutrients that are great for plants, but again, this would be used on a much smaller scale compared to something like the shale or the decomposed granite. Now, when you're adding these kind of sands to soil, you also want to make sure and put in some compost. If you mix sand with clay and bake it in the Texas sun, you make a really nice brick, but not very good soil. The compost mixed in will actually help to open up clay soils on a microscopic level and make them much looser and better for your plants. They also add nutrition. For Backyard Basics, I'm Meredith Giles. Find out more at klru.org slash ctg and be sure to check out our blog. Next week, spice things up with Herbs for Health. Until then, I'll see you in the garden. To learn about today's program, watch online and follow CTG's blog, check out klru.org slash ctg. Support for Central Texas Gardener comes from GeoGrowers, offering custom soil blends for lawns, gardens, xeriscaping, and organic landscaping supplies. More information at geogrowers.net.